There's always been an innovation economy, and J.P. Morgan has an entire business dedicated to helping it thrive. By bringing together founders, startups, investors, and ideas, J.P. Morgan's commercial bank helps empower thousands of high-growth companies, companies that are shaping the present and the future. With tailored banking solutions and a global business network, J.P. Morgan helps innovators scale for today and tomorrow. Visit jpmorgan.com forward slash startups to find out how they can help build your future. Hey everyone, this is Matt Burns. Welcome to TechCrunch Live, where we help founders build better venture-backed businesses. Today's show is a little different, and it's totally not my fault. It's Alex Bouaziz. He's the CEO of, of Deal, and he's one of our guests today. And generally, we have our guests bring pitch decks, but he doesn't have one. You see, he raised over $600 million for his company Deal in just four years and didn't use a pitch deck. So that's kind of interesting. I'm excited to have him on to talk about it. And joining him is, is Anisha Cheria, a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, who led Deal Series A. And we want to know what makes Deal so special that they can raise all this money without using a pitch deck. Two quick things, and then we'll get into it. Number one, TechCrunch has other shows, including Equity, which won a Webby last year. Now, this year, our other show, Found, uh, is, is up for a Webby, and it'll mean the world to me if you can jump over there and give them a vote. And if you have not listened to Daryl and Jordan on Found, please do. They're so much better than I am. The lastly, use the instructions and hop in to apply for today's pitch practice. We're still looking for three companies to pitch to, to Alex and Anish. And we're going to do feedback this time. So you have two minutes to pitch, and then they're going to give you four minutes of feedback. It's it's fantastic, but you have to be in hop in to apply. So with that, Alex, Anish, thanks for being here. Thanks, Matt. Matt, for everyone applying to pitch, Matt has uh, promised us it will not be like Squid Games. Yeah, that's really right. High stakes, yeah. but not that high stakes. Exactly. <laughs> not nearly as high as stakes. I want to make that clear. It's a whole lot lower. So don't believe what he's saying. <laughs> Well, thank you for having us, Matt. Yeah. Well, Alex, I need to start with you. Let's give a timeline of deals founding and fundraising. When was the company founded? Yeah. Um, so I'm first super excited to be here with Anish. Uh, he's seen quite the story at Deal, so it's going to be a very fun chat. Uh, so when was Deal started? So we, we started in early 2019. We went through Y Combinator, and we were you know that company that pivoted five days before Demo Day. Um, so def definitely didn't find our fit for quite a bit. Uh, but we officially launched our product in April 2019 and raised our seed round at the time. Um, and then the different time, you know, the different timelines that I think are interesting are uh, we raised our Series A in May 2020, uh, raised on the back of that our Series B in September 2020, our Series C in April 2021, and recently our Series D. Uh, in October 2021. So that was about 600 mil uh, across, I think less than 18 months. So it was a, a bit of a ride. I'm taking a, taking a break from fundraising for a little bit. <laughs> yeah. How are when, you, Alex? I can never tell. <laughs> well, I guess that's my question, Alex. When are you filing your S1? Well, uh, I think we've got time. Uh, we, we actually just announced that we reached uh, 100 million AR. And thank you guys actually for covering it because we didn't plan it as news. And uh, yeah, I mean, we're very excited about the, the future of Dan, where we're going, but I think it's a little early. Ask my board member, he's here. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, we cover these when, when startups hit 100 million annual recurring revenue, right? Because it's, it's an important signal that now by pretty much any definition of the word, you're no longer a startup and you can go to public markets. Do you still yeah. need capital to scale? We're definitely a startup and we still have a lot to do. We've only, in the company is only, I think, three years old now. We've been in market for, what, two years. Like, we've got so much to do, so much to build. We're definitely a startup and there's still a lot of upside, a lot to build. And, um, you know, I definitely wouldn't consider us anything else than that. <laughs> what, why do you consider yourself a startup? Like, what is it specifically? Um, I think it's a different thing. It's just, uh, first, we're, we're growing really fast. That means organizational changes are happening really fast. Um, you know, the, the type of people we need and how the company evolves. It's just very, very high pace. I mean, I'm, I'm quite biased and, you know, maybe you can get the perspective finish on that, but I think we still ship at the cadence that a five person people team, I think. Uh, and that's, that's the mindset, right? It's always be building, always being focused on customers and uh, not losing yourself into into the corporate part of building a company, although it is very important to build the right infrastructure and to make sure that every, you know everything is aligned. Having the mindset of we're nowhere near where we need to be is what at least that's what to me is the most important things for startups. 
Yeah, you're, I you're totally full- agree with Alex. I think it's uh, one of the most remarkable parts about Deal is just the momentum. Like startups have gravity as they scale, and so far Deal has defied gravity. It's been amazing to watch. Truly. Uh-huh. Yeah, let's keep it that way. <laughs> now, Anish, you led the Series A, right? Did you mm. foresee at the time how quickly Deal would grow? or And did you see at the time that they're going to eventually go public? I completely predicted it. Absolutely. No, Matt, of course not. <laughs> now, look, I think it's hard to meet Alex and not get the feeling of inevitability. And I think that's how a lot of the best founders are. There's just this feeling of momentum and they're in a hurry. Alex is always in a hurry and it's going to happen. And the feeling is it's going to happen whether I'm a part of it or not. And it's just an, ex- I mean, that's exactly the kind of feeling that you want to feel as an investor. And, and, you know, that's how it felt two years ago. And that's how it certainly feels today. Yeah. I'm curious about that first meeting. Who was it a pitch to Andreessen, Alex, or, or did Andreessen reach out to you? Um, so I think initially it was an investor introduction. So we actually met in person. He's the only person I met in person out of all my fundraising rounds, which I met later on, uh, mm-hmm. because we raised all of our rounds remotely, which was always quite funny. I mean, very fitting for the narrative uh, of deal. Um, but we, I think we had a short meeting, right? Like we grabbed coffee mm-hmm. in October and it was an introduction from Ryan um, from product I mean, at the time, right? Ryan Hoover, um, great investor. And um, I think you can, you pinged me back a couple of months later, right? Post that coffee. I think that was the, the flow. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And I think more than anything else, we didn't talk that much about the business. We talked a bit about the product. It was that feeling that I remember, that feeling of like, this is a person that's going to do something. And, you know, we fortuitously reconnected. Yeah, I was hoping to dive into that a little more. What, what type of flags do you look for or, or signs and early pitches that you know that the startup is going to explode in a good way? Well, I look, I think founder mindset, you know, tends to not change. So I hate to keep coming back to the same thing, but, you know, output per unit of founder time. And the only way to know that, I mean, one is, of course, you, you have some intuition about it, but it's also just to get to know people over time. That's why, you know, there's that old saying that by the time you need trust, it's too late to build it. So having an opportunity to get to know people outside of the context of, look, this is going down in the next week is really important. And that's what we had the chance to do with Alex and Shua. Yeah, well, Alex, let's talk about your pitch. Why Why no pitch tech? Um, well, all the other rounds that we raised in general, um, we had to put something very small together for the GP meeting at A16Z, but most of my talks with, uh, with Anish were without an index, and then all the other rounds that we raised, we never had a deck because... I think um, one of the things that's super important for us, at least it always worked for us. And um, I don't know if you know that, Anish, but the way we burn capital. So we had raised uh, at our seed round $4.2 million. And I think we came into our Series A in March and we had like $3.8 million left in the bank. Uh, and, and that just gave us a lot of momentum, right? Like you're in a place where you're building, you're clearly growing. Um, and that was actually, I want to say pre-pandemic, even that you did that deal, right? Pre-COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, we just knew we were in the right place and we just had to keep building and we weren't in a rush to take any investment, right? Um, you know, maybe Anish mm-hmm. had some, we'll talk about the terms of the deals, but he actually gave us the terms we wanted because mm-hmm. we just didn't have the rush of actually taking any more money because we were not burning. So we kind of made it an internal concept where we like to burn uh, like around before. So, I, you know, as a seed company with a seed investment, we were burning like a pre-seed company. And I, I believe actually that still happens today, right? As a Series D company, I believe we're burning like a Series C company. And that just keeps us in check and just puts us in a much better momentum in terms of when it becomes, you know, when is the right time to fundraise. And if you have like the good momentum, you have a lot of money in the bank, then people want to invest, right? And my approach to investment is never, hey, I need that money to get there. It's more, hey, you want to buy part of our company, you want to be part of the adventure, like, this is the price, this is how it's going to work. And I want to remain focused. I don't want to be drafting pitch, pitch decks. Yeah, that's uh, right. I remember it being very opportunistic. I mean, if I remember, I don't know if you remember this, Alex, but I put a deck together to pitch you. And I think that my deck to pitch you on why we were the right firm and I was the right partner was longer than the deck you put together to pitch us. Um, and that just sort of tells you, like, we were really excited. Alex definitely had the feeling of momentum and it was opportunistic for you. I don't think you had to raise by any means. Tell me more about that deck. How often do you do that, Anish? Well, I can't reveal all my secrets here, Matt. You're oh, you can. You're just talking to us. Yeah. <laughs> it's a few friends. 
Yeah, no, look, I think for us, and this is something I don't think is too much of a secret, but we really pride ourselves on being experts in the, like, the companies, the markets, and the areas that we invest in. So like, I do fintech and fintech adjacent, and that's all that I do. So a lot of it is an exercise and also sharpening my own thinking, and then it's a way to demonstrate to founders that you know we've really done the work here. Mm-hmm. I mean, it definitely helped quite a bit, right? Like for context, what we do at Dill is we help companies hire anyone, anywhere. And it's very fintech adjacent, right? Because we move a lot of money across all the different countries. And, you know, I think the research at the time that Anish had put and, and Matt at the time with him and the depth of focus, the depth of understanding of the market and where it could go, what are the different financial services we could offer? What are the different parts of the HR stack we could tackle? Really made a difference in our perspective, like, hey, this is the right person versus some of the investors that were just, I mean, honestly, just trying to throw cash at us, which was not the right mindset. And Nisha, you're, you're on their board, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, I am. And you guys seem to have a great relationship, but what happens when there's conflict? Well, look, I, I, generally, the way I work is we always defer to the founder. So whatever Alex wants to do, I'll give him. I always commit to giving him the strong form of the truth uh, and then supporting him in whatever he decides. So I don't know if, Alex, you remember this. I think the first time we had a big discussion strategically was entering EOR. Because I know it's something that we had talked about not doing at the Series A. And then you said, well, I think I'm just going to experiment with this opportunistically. And I, you know, for a different set of reasons, I felt like, hey, we should stay focused. But I support you. And we did it. And now it's turned out to be, you know, one of the most important growth drivers of the business. So I think if you've got trust, you can resolve almost any conflict. Yeah, I'll double down on that. I think, you know, our board has always been uh, there for us when we need it. And I think it's the right mix of... Um, good insights and at the same time let us execute the thing is when when you're building a company at this growth like when the pace is as fast as what we have so many things are moving so there's so many things that are going right or going wrong that um, if you don't have enough internal perspective or if you don't have enough value add just letting us execute on what we think is the right thing is usually the right call to make even if we make mistakes because we like to move fast, we correct them pretty fast you know I we're using hop in right and I actually this is one of my favorite saying from from Johnny, uh, Hopkins founder, you know, we like to run the company like we're running out of time. And that makes it that whatever mistakes we make, we correct it really, really fast. And I think that's one of the things that our board really understood and keeps understanding even at this stage of the company, which is just let us execute. And when there's really something that you think we shouldn't do, let, like tell us. And that has been helpful. That's great insight. And, and I want to dive deeper into those, those internal culture things because you, you raised all this money without that pitch deck. And the pitch deck is often a word of God type document. How did you keep everybody aligned in those early days on the same goals and, and executions? Yeah. <clears throat> um, first, um, I still do monthly investor update. So most of my investors are getting a monthly update in terms of what's going on at the company, where are key hires, what are some of the things that we've shipped. And, um, you know, I actually thought that by now I would probably not, but I just find it really useful. And, it's, you know, we've got a pretty large bunch of investors and is actually they're actually still helping which is really great obviously our board meetings uh are quite helpful as well right we get quite a bit of materials and the whole team at a16z and now all the other you know funds we work with um have you know have quite a, a lot to say when they see that and then you know usually guide us in the right direction and you know generally i'm pretty close to my board so you know whether it's bi-weekly meetings or every every month whenever it's needed um, i've been i think i've been decent at uh, leaning on them when needed but i don't you, you tell me Anish. no it's been look i think it's a story very well told and it always has been it's just been crisp and you know storytelling really matters it's how you can it's not just how you communicate it's actually also how everyone around you communicates so when one of your engineers goes home and you know they tell their partner or they tell a friend at a cocktail party, hey, here's what I'm working on, here's why it's so important. Like for that to be crisp and easy to tell is is very, very important. And I think this has been one of Deal's strengths from day one. Yeah, I mean, you know, the price is changing as well and we're evolving. Like you said, right? We're working on we worked okay. when we started switching to our EOR model, which is basically like having like 80 plus entities around the world and like fully employing people. Like that was a pretty bold move and even in the narrative of like my board members they need to be able to fully communicate like what does deal do <laughs> so that they can get us more investors and more customers so you know keeping a tight relationship with investors is important even in the in the good times like the bad times it's very important what what about other internal uh, executives right how do you keep everybody aligned there 
Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, that, that's something that until I think our series C, I, you know, we had a quite a tight knit team and then the bench is getting bigger, right. On the exact side. And, um, on our series C, you know, um, Andreessen actually collected the run with Y Combinator and Ali Rogani joined our board. And, uh, I think he's taught me a great bunch on, uh, building a great exec bench and just making sure that you're bringing the right people all the time. So, I mean, alignment usually comes from hiring people that, um, you know, are really strong, maybe a couple months, if not a couple years ahead of what you probably need, uh, and then can really, you know, take the job end to end. And so you can forget the org and just make sure that you have the right alignment from a strategy perspective, a culture perspective, and just spend a lot of time with them. That's, uh, that has worked for us, even though, you know, we are almost 900 people, fully distributed team across 60 plus countries. I think we maintain pretty strong alignment across the whole company. Yeah, that, that's you know, just to build on that, Matt, if I may, I think one of the things, Ox, that you've done best is combining an eye for talent, like people who have a lot of potential and are just great generalists, hustlers, like those are the most important people, often the most important people in the earlier days. And then later knowing how and when to hire for specialists who actually have a lot of expertise. And that's like not an easy balance to get right. Typically companies either over hire on experts or, you know, go for too long with just the generalists. Maybe you can talk a bit about how you've done that, or or maybe it's just intuition for you. Um, yeah. Um, look, I think we're still learning there. I think we're lucky enough to be, you know, always thinking a couple of months ahead. And, um, you know, this is a, a funny company because, you know, we, since our numbers are kind of public, we added almost, you know, 50 million in AR in a quarter. And that changes the whole company, right? Like it's just not the same company. My, you know, when we hired our head of success, you know, he's, he's really great. You know, it was when we were at 10 or 15 million in AR and his pitch to me was, I know how to take it to 50, but that happened in like three months. And then three months after we were at a hundred. So like, you know, it just blows up the organization in, in so many interesting ways. <clears throat> I think for us, uh, we've always been able to kind of forecast our growth and at the same time control the forecast that we had towards, you know, our investors and our internal employees, which means that we're kind of always proactive in terms of what skills are we going to need versus what skills we have now and the strong strong generalists that you can bring early on if they've got the hustle you need the wits you need and no ego they just can build so much with you that you get to a point where it's obvious that you need to make the change and bring someone that's just more generalized i think a great example is um, our, our head of communication right like amazing exec, very, very specialized. That org used to sit under our growth department for quite a bit. And then there was a time where we thought, ooh, like comms is gonna be so big for us. Like we need to invest there. And like in two months, we hired someone amazing. And now, I mean, we're like the luckiest on earth to have her in our organization, right? So like, it, it's it's kind of natural, but at the same time, very fucked through. I don't know how to explain it further than that, to be honest. It's well done, whatever it is. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I mean, let, let's talk about your timelines for a minute it's, or your forecasts. It, to me, from an outsider, it seems like you forecasted too low several times in a row. Is that correct? Is it forecasting too low or is it forecasting it right? <laughs> you know, the, the, the thing is I learned from Anish. Uh, I don't know how you feel about me talking about it, Anish, but we'll have to go with it. The first board meeting, I forecasted too high. And you told me, I actually can't do that because the day you're public, if you miss your quarter you're screwed. Since then, I never forecast too high. I always do <laughs> forecast right, and, and I always try to beat our numbers. So that was the first lesson Anish taught me, actually, on my board deck. <laughs> Anish? I don't remember, but yeah, no, look, I, these guys have just continuously crushed numbers. I don't know what to say. I'm great. Yeah, to well, t give me general advice here for, for founders that are, are, you know, raising their Series A. What advice do you have to them for forecasting? Look, I mean, I think that there's, a, this starts to kick in a lot more at the Series B, but even at the Series A, there's a slider between story and metrics. And I think that if the slider is all the way over to story, like it better be a really compelling story, really well told. Um, and if it's all the way over to metrics, then, you know, look, there, the story is important, but secondary. So I think, you know, having both, and that's been the thing about deal. Of course, the story is well told and the team is really compelling, but like the metrics have always been so incredible that it feels like a no brainer. Um, so look, I think at the series day, it can be tricky to find that balance, but I would think carefully about, you know, as Alex said, not having to do your series A, but wanting to do it and doing it once you have that balance, right? You know, you know what Alex told me the other day, we were doing a prep call and he was like, I, I just raised on my numbers. 
the the numbers don't lie. I don't think he said that part. That's uh, that, that, that's what I was gonna say. Actually, like I think our series A. I don't know if that's wrong, but I, I felt like at least my interactions with you on that A was team market numbers because we were still a bit early when it comes to numbers. When yeah. you know yeah. you break down for that. After that, like sure, yes, uh, yes, me from Spark who led our series B was definitely team as well and potential market. But you know that's what I was telling you the other day. But like my. B, C, D investor could have just looked at our cohorts, looked at our budget and invested without talking to me. I'm pretty sure they could have. I don't know. I don't know what you think on the growth side and niche, but that's like, that's how I feel. Oh, for sure. I mean, it's a no break. Look, even at the series A, I don't know if you, I remember the revenue scale. It was hundreds of thousands of dollars, but it was growing quickly. And, you know, it's small, a small amount of data, but it, it all was going in the right direction. Plus the story was well told, plus the team, et cetera, et cetera. So there was definitely, there was some data there. You're right. It was overshadowed by like team hustle story, et cetera, but it was there. What, I mean, when, when does that make sense to lead with the data instead of the story? You touched on it earlier. I was hoping you could expand on that. Well, look, I, I think that you need both. You know, I, I do think that you need to have some of both, but I just, you know, again, I think the more data you have, the more the story feels like, uh, a reality that is playing out versus a set of assumptions that still need to be validated. And that's mm -hmm. the balance to strike. And, you know, the story changes, right? Like to, to be completely honest, like there's a lot of things we got wrong, right? Uh, and like Anish was telling you, like at the beginning at our series A, we pitched something. We were never going to do something that is today our biggest line in business, right? So, I mean, we made so many mistakes and the story you tell at your series A obviously is more is going to change and evolve over time. And it's okay to end up to those mistakes. Just you evolve with your board, you evolve with your company. No one expects you at that time to have everything right. I mean, we get most a lot of things wrong still, right? And we're still doing that. We'll keep on doing that. So tell the story that makes sense for you and that you think is going to get a lot of people excited, right? Like you want an niche to feel, shit, if I don't get on the train right now, I'm going to have to pay up in like three months from now, which is never a great feeling. And that was true. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So Alex, you you were saying that you you left Y Combinator a little early, right? Because you're still trying to find your product market fit. No, we pivoted during Y Combinator. So when pivoted. we got into YC, um, we spent True and I spent three months roaming around payments and contracts and freelance and global hiring, trying to find our fit and just iterating so much, like literally. <laughs> locked down in an apartment in San Francisco in, I, I thought it was a great area, but it's not a great area. Like market street right next to the Twitter building. I don't know if you've ever been there. I've been uh, there, yes. Not that fun. So we ended up being like on lockdown for like three months, just building, building and iterating and going through YC there. And I think it was five days or six days before demo day. We just came to our, at the time, you know, YC partner and told him, Hey, this looks interesting. Like, can we dive on that product? And he was like, yeah, that looks cool. Just build it. And that kind of was the, trajectory after that for them. Yeah, the, the the timing around the idea is always something that, that founders struggle with. And I think Mark Andreessen has a neat theory that a, a startup will be successful if it's at the cross section of technology, economics, and psychology. How, how What kind of advice do you have for founders about the timing around launching their product? Oof. Um, a few things. Uh, first, you should always be launching. I actually learned that from YC is that most people forget who you are, what you are within two months. You can try and try and try and try again. Uh, only you know that you've launched. So that one is super important. The second one is uh, we've always been very metrics driven. Um, and that's like the one thing that was quite interesting for us is every time we launched a product, we felt like we had something, but we never really did. The only time we did is when, you know, the story of Deal is it's actually on our about page on the website. One of our batchmates started using Deal the way it is today. Uh, and we were like, okay, this is weird. Like what's going on here? Like there's something interesting. And the time that we followed our customers really and like went to talk to them and realized, okay, there's, there's a big gap in the market there. Like how are people doing it? And eventually how are they doing it right? Because at the time we thought it was just about payments. Eventually we realized it was about a lot more like global compliance, global hiring. Like those were the things that were quite interesting. Uh, I think it, so it's, it's all about like talking to your users, iterating on the, mar on the market, on the problem, you know, or you feel right. Like our story is, 
you know, a French founder and a Chinese founder building together in the Valley, a company that's meant to help other companies hire other talents, right? Like it's quite, it's quite a relatable story. It's something we, we felt and something, you know, we, we've lived through. So, you know, the relatability of the product in terms of what we wanted to build, the product founder fit. I don't know how much you talk about that, Anish, but like product founder fit yeah. was quite good. And then it's just grit, right? Like I, I didn't get in YC the first three times or two times I applied, right? It's just building, building, and building. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, it's like what informs your intuition? It feels like it can be one of two things. It's either lived experiences, which is what Alex is describing, or it's I've spent my entire career in one field and therefore I have a differentiated point of view. And it does feel like those, you know, you can't study the market top down and, you know, and do do a market map and decide what company needs to be built. You've got to use your intuition and that's got to come from somewhere. Yeah, what, has there been a time where you've seen a pitch and you just knew it was too early? What did you tell the founder? Well, I'm not the one who decides what's you know too early or not. It's really the market. So it's, to go back to Alex's point, just launch. You know, launch just and launch happens, and let's right? find out. Exactly, well, October, 100%. October was too early, right? When we met the first time. I mean, we didn't even talk about that, but it was way too early for us to actually work together at the time. And then once we reconnected, you had launched. And yeah, the timing done. was right, you know? Yeah. Customer is a bit of growth, some direction. Team started totally. to build it up, right? It, it kind of made more sense. So that brings us today. And, and last week, you announced that 100 million uh, ARR. So I was hoping you could spend the last five minutes here talking about scaling right now, scaling forward. What does your, your forecast say right now? Well, I haven't reforecasted. <laughs> I had a, I had an on store board that we would do something like three x in twenty twenty two, but it looks like I need to reforecast. Um, we'll see. I think it'd be a great year if we can four x on our revenue, so so two x from what we have right now. But uh, let's see how the infrastructure develops. You know, we're very very focused on customer experience. It's not growth at all costs. It's how do we grow, but at the same time keep on giving an amazing employee experience, keep on helping companies have a good experience when hiring people. And uh, that's the main, main focus. And uh, if we can combine great customer experience with good growth, then then that's what matters to us. Uh, and yeah, I mean, we're truly only getting started. So let's, let's hope for a 2X at least before the end of the year, if not more. Does, does that make the board happy, Anish? Yeah, yes. Always happy. Always happy. I did not say <laughs> that, right? The board stick to the numbers. So the <laughs> yes, yeah. So he's a board member. I mean, what, what have you seen, Anish, that, that's allowed the company to scale so quickly? I'm looking for something that founders can take to their own companies. Look, a lot of it is just the you know continued speed of execution. It feels like you know things can only slow down, and this team has managed to maybe speed up, but certainly not slow down. And when you're moving that quickly, you know, it just, again, like it really does defy gravity. To go back to your earlier question, you know, when is a startup a startup? I would say that a startup is a startup for five years after they launch. And after five years, no matter how, what scale they're at, they're no longer a startup. And it feels like that's the sort of part of time that's the enemy. So we're very much still in like startup mindset. And that, look, I think that applies as much when you're two people as it does, you know, when you're 2000. Alex, you, you like that answer, right? Because you're still a startup. We're definitely still a startup, like 100%. <laughs> yeah. Well, give those founders one more piece of advice. When you look back to, to pitching your, your first couple of rounds, what do you look back and, and, and you're embarrassed at? Ooh, embarrassed a lot. Um, we got quite a bit of no's actually at the very beginning. Um, what am I embarrassed at? You know, I was embarrassed about that, but it ended up paying off at our seed round. Um, me and Shuo were really good at splitting our, like, our chats. Like, we were really good in tandem. Like, so for context, Shuo is my co-founder. You should probably have her more than me. She's the interesting one on this type of shows. And she's the, she's the smart one on the team. And actually, this is exactly what we used to do. We used to clearly play her off as like the smarter one into the, in the team when we were pitching. And we just had a really good, we had a very well rehearsed pitch that just, you know, highlighted her strength versus our weaknesses, which at the time, to be honest, was we had, we had no idea what we were doing, right? We were like one week and a half into building a product. We had a lot to figure out. We just had like, good colleges, good team that have known each other for a long time and going through YC, which is, is an advantage, right? Uh, but just like that, that pitch was so well rehearsed at this stage where everything 
when there's nothing and it's all about team cohesion and who you are and what are you going to build and why you're building it like if you can really tell a great story there then people are going to want to come i mean you have to believe it right you have to feel it you have to be passionate about it like you know i'm excited to help 100 million people get to work for the best companies in the world regardless of where they're from right that excites me that makes me want to work if you can pass that excitement and if you have if you can build and ship then you you can convince anyone to follow you in your right life i think i don't know i'm maybe biased but yeah well i, th I think that's a great place to end it that it, your passion and your competency really comes through and, and i can see why it was easy to pitch without a pitch deck but uh, now we're going to do that live on, on, on here on Pitch Practice. Both of you, thank you for joining us for the TechCrunch live session. And you're sticking around for, for Pitch Practice now, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we worked you into this part, right? So what's going to happen is we picked three startups from the attendance on, on Hopin. And there was a lot of submissions this time. So we have three startups. And the first one is Olina from Ender Tuning. And she's going to, or Ender Turing. She's going to have two minutes to pitch your company without a deck. And then you get four minutes of, of feedback from the three of us, okay? Melina, are you there? Yes, hi. I was hi. promoted and rejoining. Hi. How are you? Hi, Lena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm good. And it's a little bit pressing to hear that I'm one of three. <laughs> I thought there would be like 10 teams or whatever. <laughs> no, we're gonna make it special. So you have two minutes to present no ducks, and then you get four minutes of feedback, okay? Yes, absolutely. All Hi, right, so I'm now. Elena. Hi, I'm Elena from Ender Turing, and we drive sales and customer care teams to their excellence. So how we do this, um, we're a platform that analyzes all the conversations across sales and customer care teams. It provides analytics and real life feedback from our AI to real people to improve it, their skills. Imagine there is 800 million of hours of recorded conversations daily, and less than 2% of those conversations are really tracked for the purpose of training and coaching. And actually, company don't choose to hire lousy sales or customer care agents, and those people don't choose to be a lousy employer. Uh, but uh, the, the problem is that there is no individualized and real-time feedback on how they are doing. Our AI platform allows real-time analysis of the conversation, providing feedback what the person is lacking in soft and hard skills, and also combining it with the best examples of top performers. So we collect top performing guys, and then they have their best practices to the rest of the team. We are three founders, six people in the team, we made it last year with 10 paying customers. We are pretty early. And we already go into the US market with a product from Europe. And we do 24 languages with our own automatic speech recognition and natural language processing, which we don't buy from a third party. We have our own team. And we made 135K in annual recurring revenue within 10 paying customers and ready to scale. Thank you very much. Hi, Elena. <laughs> very good. That was great. Thank you. What, what is your website address Sorry. so people can find you? Yeah, it's uh, www.enderturing as one word, ender as ender game, and turing as Alan Turing.com. Great. Thank you. Any feedback? Alex, after you. Me first. Okay, sure. First of all, good job, Olena. Thank you for taking the time today. Uh, and this is super exciting. Um, well, so there's a few things. And I guess, Matt, do we do questions now or after? Sure. No, you can ask whatever you want. So at Dill, I believe we use a company called Gong. Um, how similar is Gong to what you're building? And um, I guess, how differentiated is it? So how similar is that we both analyze conversations? How different is that Gong is towards more management and providing analytics for management to see how their pipeline converts and how to manage people. We're more focused on providing help and self-coaching for employees themselves. So our approach is, their approach is um, up to bottom. So from manager to employee to control and improve and push performance. Our approach is bottom up. 
So we upskill people and then improve the performance of the team. And all our features are focused on the end user as a sales rep, not a manager. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I guess it does answer your, the, my question. I think my only feedback is it maybe is very personal. Uh, but how long have you said that you've worked on on this company? One year. Yeah. So you know, and, and maybe it's like completely off, but whatever. I'll just say it. like I feel like building your own NLP engine after one year for twenty four languages seems like something's off. Um, Maybe it's not, but it just fit like for a seed stage company making 500k an hour after one year of building it, just you know, doesn't like it just rings up. Mm, okay, I need to clearly dive deeper into this company, or else I don't think you, I don't think you need to raise it at that stage. My experience with investors is like they're quite pragmatic. It's like um, maybe I would have opened up like more. Why are you the right person to build this? Like, why are you building this? Why are you? Why does it make sense for you to build it? And how are you going to make this a great company? And then talk about the founders and eventually the market and eventually the tech. Because I don't know. My my guts is the tech can be that crazy advanced. Like maybe you're not using Watson or whatever in the back end, but like it would be quite the lift to build such a strong engine in like one year. Um. Yeah, that that's a good point. Uh, probably I was a little bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> pointing to refocus on what we do. But actually, we have um, a really cool guys, too, of uh, AI researchers who created pipeline for automatically creating new languages. So we don't do this like with manual uh, human labeling or something with the data. And why? Because we are European and 34 languages in Europe. You cannot just work with one language to, to cover the market. You just have to. And uh, if we would start with the US, yes, it would be probably one language and that's it. Yeah, I'm we're French. simple folks in the US. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm French, <laughs> I understand the problem. And if you, you, you're the real yeah, yeah. value. Yeah. No, no, I mean, look, I, I agree with some of what Alex is saying. Look, I think the big thing that I would start with is just what is your personal connection to this? Like, why are you building this? Why do you want to work on this for 20 or 30 or 50 years or you know, however long? Like, why is it so important and personal to you? And I think out of that may flow the answer to some of Alice's questions. So maybe you spent your whole career researching NLP and this is the perfect application. Maybe you're a frustrated sales rep and you know a manager changed your life by giving you just that right piece of feedback at the right time. So I think it's you know your personal connection. I think it's you know maybe describing the importance of the technology. Is it a 10x better or not and why? And then are you solving for the same or a distinct use case from Gong? I think is also important that we touched on. Mm -hmm. Um, three seconds and I leave, but maybe you can <laughs> see me somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah. So, my, my like, is gone. Me, so he yeah. has to pay on me. <laughs> we can, we can help with the connection. That, that's happy what to, I like happy to, do. to connect uh, and share more. Yes. Thank you so much. But thank it's a story it very really... well told. You're very, you're articulate and you're confident. And, you know, I came away feeling like, Hey, there's something happening here, whether I'm a part of it or not. I'm in the U.S. Uh, in June. Let's get cool. that. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. We have two more. Next, we have David from Yol B. It's two words. I don't know how you pronounce that. Every week, I have, I have trouble with startup names. David, are you here? Anish, that's hustle. You got to respect that. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Absolutely. Take your shot, right? David's connecting on Zoom, so we'll have him in a second. All right. David, I think you're muted. There you are. How are you, sir? Hey, guys. I'm doing well. How are you all doing? Good. How hey. do you say your company name? Yolby. I got it right. You did get it right. It actually used to be Yolobi, but uh, we changed it. Marketing people felt it was a better name. So there we go. All right. Well, you have two minutes to present your company starting now. Perfect. Gentlemen, thanks, uh, uh, thanks for, for joining me today. My name is David Douglas. I'm the founder and CEO of Yolby, which stands for Your Life Only Better. We're uh, effectively a job and upskilling or reskilling uh, platform. We're focused exclusively on the entry-level uh, marketplace. We feel that the future um, will be quite detrimental, in particular for entry-level. Uh, what with AI and the dissemination of many jobs, as well as sort of the future of work where there's going to be an incumbent responsibility on people to continually skill up. 
It'll be particularly troublesome for the underserved populations, people with disabilities and things of that nature. We built a very unique platform to address this. So we basically uh, partnered with organizations who are catering currently to those, uh, to, to, the, to, those, to those populations. So those are workforce agencies, school districts, cities, uh, communities, uh, community-based organizations, and so on. Um, they not only bring uh, access to that population, but they also bring access to quite a few employers as well. So we built a three-sided marketplace, which is the most difficult uh, to, to build. Uh, it's a B2B platform. We are currently engaged with a number of organizations serving this population, including the entire city of Milwaukee, where we have 60 different agencies working with us. Uh, we also work with a number of different schools. We are launching a product for the solar-based industry, uh, which is going to have a tremendous amount of uptake in terms of opportunities and jobs. Um, and we also have a grant through a number of different research organizations catering to vocational rehab, where we have the ability to launch in up to 10 different states, starting with the state of Illinois this year. Um, we're currently looking to raise $1.5 million in the seed. Uh, we are revenue, uh, but we're looking to build a lot of premium-based features for the remainder of this year, uh, grow out for those three different target markets, and then to expand later from that point. And that's where we are. Very good, David. That, that was that was great. And just as a reminder to listeners, we picked these companies out of our audience about 20 minutes ago and they had no prep time. So that was wonderful. Uh, Anish, Alex, questions? Alex, you're muted. Yeah, there you go. Um, I can start. Uh, I'll ask you the same question uh, that I asked Elena, David. So, you know, why are you building this? Why are you, you have so many things you could be working on. Why is this you know, personally important to you? Well, we started out focusing on the youth market. In particular, I'm a father, um, and one of my daughters got caught up in a bunch of uh, negative things. Uh, and I was, it was out of anger at uh, social media and the lack of access to good uh, social capital. So one of the prerequisites for the company is we need to arm people, in particular the entry level, with social capital. So uh, we started out with a twist toward LinkedIn. So people who join our platform actually connect with people, and that's the actually best way to, to find opportunities in the first place. So um, I am, am intent on arming people with social capital they need to succeed. Got it. And then one other question is, you know, how, like, how important is software? How much leverage do you get from software? Feels like it's a hard bootstrapping problem with the marketplaces and it's not totally clear to me what the product is. Um, yeah, I, so, so the solution to this problem is not, it can't be entirely software based. And by the way, I'm, I come from the corporate uh, world uh, as a consultant and implementing software in general is not uh, is never the solution. So you need to bring people with you. The change, there's a change management function associated with it. But, but actually, we haven't had a lot of uh, concern. Uh, this is uh, rung as a true solution for all of the organizations catering to that population. There's nothing that's actually working for workforce agencies today. They have very tremendous difficulty reaching out to populations and so on. So we come to the market with a platform that allows them to basically emulate like an Instagram, connect with me, follow me, follow my organization. And by benefiting, I don't get to see Kim Kardashian's pictures. I get to see all the resources that the city brings, all the agencies that are part of it, all of the people that are part of that overall. I can partake in that and I can join a number of those. Uh, and we see that replication, being able to replicate all of those different networks across across the United States uh, and then ultimately across the world. I think it applies quite a bit. My team is global. Um, so we're excited to start expanding as soon as we possibly can. And we are bootstrapped. I've been bootstrapping this thing for a number of years, had about four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars in uh, in investment capital. Um, but uh, but this has been a passion project for me and and I am intent on making it work. Yeah, the passion is obvious. Absolutely. Thank Alex, you. do you have any questions? Um, Feedback. Well, yeah, first, I think, you know, this is really Salut, Alex. Je parle Salut. français aussi. Uh, but I don't think the audience will understand much of it. But, uh, I, I think this. I think this is great. Great. I think you're working on something super interesting, and upskilling is important. Um, it, this is a question I love to ask people, and I'm sorry if that puts you on the spot. But how many years have you been working on this? Uh, about six years. Um, first, I didn't have a technology co-founder for a while, and so I, I bootstrapped in high schools trying to figure out the problem. Brought on a co-founder, dealt with the eventual ups and downs of that. Uh, he he moved on, and then I continued to build out there. Brought on another co-founder, so it's been. Uh, but it's we're been we're in the best place we've ever been, right? So my 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 feedback 
Um, and Anish, I don't know how you feel about that, but you know, after six years of building a business, I think it's usually quite hard to convince um, venture capitalists to invest in your company, unless there is like a great way to show that now is the time where you're going to be able to double down and scale and really get there. And uh, you know, my question for you is, um, if you were to start again, it's point zero, right? Like, what would you have done differently over the last six years, right? Like, get me to see, okay, now is the time. Now is the, now is when I should get on board because it's not going to be like the first six years. We're, we're running out of time, but take, take 30, 40 seconds and, and answer that. That deserves that. Yeah. Um, you know, I've always said if I had been handed a check for three or $5 million at the beginning, we would have failed. Um, this is an incredibly difficult space. And I, I would never forsake everything that we've learned. There's a, there's a reason why it's been very difficult to sort of drive uh, opportunities to people traditionally have been underserved, and we're going to extend it from there. Um, I've had the luxury of having failed in what we currently built, uh, which is why uh, ultimately this has taken a, a, a certain amount of time. And we rebuilt the entire product. We've never been in a better place. I've got a team now that's committed, uh, excited, and we have plans for i think a bright future so i've learned a lot in this process and that's what i would actually say to everybody um, that's so, great there you go. well david thank you so much and what's your website uh yolbe.com y-o-l-b-e.com and i'm david at uh actually yolobe y-o-l-o-b-e.com or yolbe both they both work so thank, thank you all you very so much. much appreciate it and you, uh, alex congratulations on everything that you're doing man appreciate it it's, it's awesome thank stuff you. good luck my friend all Thank right, we have we have one more company. We have Surge from Strict. Surge is coming up, and and actually, Anish, can you answer that? Like, what what do you do when companies have been around for for a while and they're struggled? Like, what do you still invest in them, or or what do you look for? I don't think there's a hard rule, but I think to Alex's point, there's got to be a moment where something is changing. Even the world, either the world has changed, um, or something you know that's specific to the product or the company has changed. You know, because startups really are momentum machines. And, you know, when you lose oh, it, it's yeah. hard to reestablish it yeah, outside of some external catalyst. Uh, that's great. All right, Serge, your turn, sir. Hey, Serge. Oh, yeah. Hello, guys. Hello. You have two minutes starting now. Okay. Uh, I'm Serge, co founder of Stretch. Uh, Stretch is a video first internet with no ads web three economy built in. Why video? Uh, no, because people don't read anymore, and video is dominating format of delivering information today. YouTube is the number one search engine for next gen, and that means video uh, is a new entry point uh, to the internet for next gen people. But at the same time, video as a format is stuck in the past and has not been changing during the last 25 years. Video is still the same uh, passively watched pixels, but uh, just in different sizes. And how it's possible? New uh, entry point to the internet has no any capabilities uh, like on web to interactively uh, interact with uh, these like objects. That's why people leave a video to get additional information outside. Just imagine for a second, if all materials demonstrated in videos were not just a screenshots or screencasts, but real, tappable and usable objects you can interact with, with dynamic data, and use it, for example, by something uh, or something like that. For example, you can keep watching video and independently at the same time enlarge uh, photos or uh, build your own uh, route or something like that, flip pages on book, buy it right here inside the video. We developed, developed this unique video format where all demonstrated materials are detached from the video itself to let you interact with all objects inside video, like on website, but inside uh, the video. It's like a video on steroids that absorbed all web the capabilities inside and welcome to the next gen video first internet and install right. next gen video browser on our website so th thank you for that now now guys do you have any feedback on on the picture or the picture style or or anything like that i understand this is outside of your areas I'll i can answer yeah. um <clears throat> okay so 
Sorry, I'm, I'm usually pretty brutal or honest, so I'm going to be very honest. Um, I think it's a bit hard to understand what you truly do. Um, you know, during YC, I don't know why I keep coming back to YC, maybe because they taught me a lot of great things, but like you need to have like a one-liner that makes it really, really clear, right? Like we help people hire anyone, anywhere, right? Like I'm not sure I fully got what you did through that, which is not great. So I think something you should fix. Um, so again, yeah, I know we talked about it a couple of times, but I do think, at least for me at your stage, my, do you have any revenue or not yet? We just launched a few like one week ago. That's why. Okay, okay so I, I would go just, back to what we said pitch. for the first two pitches, right? I would very much focus on like the team, right? Like, why are you, what makes you different? Are you like a video expert? Do you have like, I don't know, some computer vision background? I'm, I'm, I can't really say because I'm not sure I fully understood what the company does. But making it super simple, super accurate, especially in the space like video, which is super crowded and super hard, is super important. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is I would be very focused, especially at your stage on the team and the market, right? That like I didn't really get a sense of like why you why are you guys special and how big this can really get. We all, you know, video is big, right? Like thanks YouTube, but like what makes you guys really special? I'm I'm not sure. It's good advice. Yes, Anish. Yeah, look, I mean, I, so plus one on the team question, I'm not going to re-ask the question I asked the other two founders on, you know, why, what's your personal connection? Look, I think the thesis is really interesting. To me, browser feels like one of the last platforms that no one has really gone after in an interesting way. I know there's a couple of startups, but I love, you know, the idea of attacking the browser generally. I think with consumer, it's impossible to predict what consumers want or how they'll behave. I think you can have a hypothesis and test it. So I think with consumer plays like this, which I believe this is, You've just got to launch. Um, and I think, by the way, the thing that's maddening about building consumer companies, I've built two, is that a lot of times it kind of works. It doesn't, it rarely like completely fails. And if it completely succeeds, you know, but, you know, getting to the place where you're like, am I just not trying hard enough or is it not solving an important enough pain point is a psychology shift that's super important. So I, I would say with something like this, you know, the thesis sounds reasonable, but, you know, I'd really just want to see how it performs in market. Anish is a consumer investor. He got into SaaS for a very weird reason. Mm -hmm. deal, but he's a consumer guy. Deal, deal does some consumer. Deal does some consumer. consumer. <laughs> so I would say, yeah. Look, consumer is really hard. My first company was in consumer, actually. And um, it was actually in the video space, funnily enough. Um, and it didn't do very well for lots of different reasons. I think what I learned, and you know, maybe something that can be interesting for you, um, is that one, it's really hard to convince video, like consumer investor or video investor is to invest until you have like real traction. So I would really focus on getting enough traction where you can get someone excited or at least some form of product market, some form of early signs of product market fit because consumer is super hard, right? Like, I mean, I guess and Andrew, right, from A16Z can tell you, like, I think he doesn't, I mean, I, don't, I can't speak for him, but I think you don't really look at a consumer deal unless there's like significant upward traction, right, Anish? Yeah, yeah, it's because you can't really, you just have to observe the phenomenon. That's like the best way to invest in consumer. Hmm. So yeah. I, I wanted to give you a quick second. Do you have a one or two liner on your company? Uh, what, one, one or two? Could you describe your company in one or two lines? Uh, yes, the, we, we are building video first uh, internet with the first mobile video internet browser. We believe to the video. And we believe the video is a uh, one and new entry point to the internet, and every everything will be start with video. And in our case, we we'll, uh, end with video too because all transactions built in inside video, all like interactions built in inside video. That's why we believe video is the future, and we will be the first browser in this space. That's great. I see it no. here. I'm going to download it. Yes, yes. And it's that got five stars, video. so that's always good. Oh, thank you very much. You can try it and feel uh, like smell of the future of the next gen uh, browser by yourself. I will. Yeah. I love yeah. it. What's what's your website again? Uh, stretch. Stretch means uh, stream plus pitch. Stretch. S T R I T C H uh, dot com. You can install. A video internet browser from there right. and uh, yeah we appreciate for any feedback because as i mentioned we just uh, started for us it's very important and uh, all right thank you very much for your feedback yeah thank serge you. thank you thank you for joining us today and, and, yeah, and, and, and go ahead 
I'll give you yeah, the last ju ju Just one very important sentence on my screen. Uh, because we have like unusual business model uh, with no ads where businesses pay subscriptions and this share revenue, we sh share this revenue with um, creators. And we think we finally uh, find a way how to solve the problem which Merck and Reason didn't solve in Netscape Navigator by uh, him own words. And he called it like the original scene of the internet because uh, he wanted to build in pay button inside the browser, but he unfortunately didn't. Unfortunately for entire internet. And uh, that's why we built in a uh, business model and pay button from the day one to that's entire great. ecosystem. Well, Serge, I got I to gotta cut you off there. We're out of time here, but oh, thank you so sorry, much for yeah. joining yeah. us. Thank you. It's thank okay. Thank you very much. A, and a say niche... hi to Mark Andreessen. We find the we find the soul. Yeah, so I'll, of, I'll I'll have a chat with Mark pro, about it. Or this yeah. problem. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Anish, Alex, I respect everyone's hustle today. Thank you for joining us, including you too. And I hope you guys have a great day. Thank and you, last man. thing nice before we go, uh, please go over and vote for that Webby for found. Daryl and Jordan deserve it. Thank you all. Thanks for having. Me.